Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Mike Celia. I'm director of the Princeton Environmental Institute, and I want to welcome all of you to the second in our uh, PEI faculty seminar series, the second of these for the semester. Uh, as most of you know, we offer this seminar series uh, the first Tuesday of each month, and uh, the series is somewhat unique in that all the speakers are Princeton faculty members. Uh, before we get uh, started with this seminar, I wanted to make a couple of quick announcements. Um, PEI, the Environmental Institute, will be co-sponsoring a couple of lectures uh, in the next few weeks. Next week, we're co-sponsoring with our friends in the Center for Contemporary China, a lecture on uh, environmental impacts of China's Belt and Road Initiative. The speaker is Kelly Sims Gallagher from Tufts University, and the title is Greening uh, Chinese Overseas Investments. That will be Wednesday, October 14th at 4.30 p.m. You should receive information about that. If not, uh, send any of us in PEI an email and we'll get you the information. And just to one other quick note, uh, the following week on October 22nd, also at 4.30, in conjunction with our friends at Brazil Lab on campus, uh, we'll have uh, Tasso Acevedo from Brazil uh, speaking on Amazonia on Fire, Revealing Ecosystem Transformations and Threats with Science and Transparency. If you don't know Tasso and his work, he does this remarkable image processing uh, from, from satellite imagery to identify in real time, basically, ongoing deforestation and land use change in Amazonia and other parts of the world. All right, so I hope you'll join us for those. They should be really excellent uh, seminars. In regard to the, today's seminar, as we uh, started to do last uh, month, we will have a moderator or a discussant who will uh, be part of this. And I'm happy to say that uh, our colleague and fellow PEI faculty member, Bess Ward, uh, will serve as today's discussant. Finally, I'll remind all of you that uh, you're all welcome to ask questions as the talk is going on. You, you do that by using the Q&A box, which should be, I think, at the bottom of your screen. You simply type the question into the box it will be trans transferred on to us, and then Bess will be coordinating the, the questions. Uh, as a note, the chat function will be disabled, so you need to use the Q&A button uh, in order to ask questions. All right, uh, so that's it for the logistics. Uh, now I have the pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, my, my longtime friend, uh, Peter Jaffe from Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, Peter is the William L. Knapp Class of 1947 professor of civil and environmental engineering. Uh, he's held many positions at the university, including department chair of CEE from 1999 to 2005, and more recently as associate director for research in the Anliger Center from 2013 to 2019. Um, as you will have seen from the title of the talk, Peter is an expert on the fate and transport of different kinds of, of pollutants in water systems, soils, and sediments. Uh, including, among other things, a, a deep expertise in wetland systems. Uh, his research combines field and lab work with analysis and modeling and includes some really great uh, long-standing work in, at, at field sites in New Jersey like the Meadowlands. Uh, he may say something about his field work uh, today during the talk. Peter has served on many boards and committees for other universities, for uh, other organizations, including government organizations like like the NIH and the National Academies. Uh, he's received a number of awards. I'll simply mention three of them quickly here. Uh, he's a fellow of the AGU. Uh, the citation uh, that he received is for fundamental quantitative work on biogeochemical reaction and transport phenomena in soils and sediments. That again tells you about his work. He's a member of the American Academy of Environmental Engineers. And the last one I'll mention is a recent award that he's gotten, which is an International Excellence Award from the Guangzhou Association of Industrial Environmental Protection. Uh, for those who don't know, Guangzhou is a city in the south of China, sometimes called Canton. Um, uh, and I, I mention this just to point out that Peter has a longstanding um, and very impactful international uh, component to his work. In this case, it's China. He's had even longer uh, work that has gone on in places like Korea. And the second part of this is the industrial part, because while he does these fundamental science and engineering studies, 
you'll see that they have enormous uh, practical application, including large-scale industrial applications. So uh, with that as a very short introduction, uh, please join me in giving uh, a very big virtual welcome to, uh, to my friend and colleague, Peter Jaffe. Peter, the screen is yours. Mike, thank you for the nice introduction and, and for the invitation to speak today to, to the Princeton Environmental Institute. Let me share my screen. All right, here we are. So I'll, I'll as Mike mentioned, I'll be talking about um, using this novel FIAMOX bacterium for PFAS defluorination. And there are two things that, that will come to mind. First, what is PFAS? So I will start my, my talk a little bit looking over what are PFAS, what do we know about them, why are they important? Then I'm going to talk about this FIAMOX process. And at the end, I'm going to sort of combine the two, how we use this FIAMOX process for PFAS defluorination and some applications. It, it will be at a very high level. There are many details that I just don't have time to go into today. All right, what, what are PFAS? If PFAS stands for per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances. Um, a polyfluorinated substance is one where many carbon bonds are carbon hydrogen bonds versus a perfluorinated um, compound is one where all non-functional groups uh, carbons have a carbon fluorine bond. So there's no carbon hydrogen bond. Um, <clears throat> why do we care about those compounds? Um, they make, they're resistant to water and grease strains. Uh, we use them in carpets. Anytime you buy a carpet or clothing that, is, that says it's a stain resistance, it's probably treated with PFAS. Uh, packaging for food, um, if you have pizza boxes that don't become soggy right away, they have been treated with PFAS. Cookingware, firefighting foam, um, there are hundreds and hundreds of products that have this PFAS. Overall, there are about 5,000 different compounds that, that fall into this uh, group that we call the PFAS perfluorinated alkyl substances. So what is unique about them? The, for those of you that remember your chemistry, the carbon fluorine bond is the strongest covalent bond in organic chemistry. And that makes these compounds extremely stable. So you can have a fluorinated compound, Teflon is one, uh, that you can have in your frying pan at a very, very high temperature, it doesn't burn. Um, we can make firefighting foam, it's, we put it on, um, very high temperature fires, it doesn't burn. If it was less stable, it would burn. And, but by being this stable, um, it's also very hard for bi biology to address it and, and biodegrade it. So that's where the name uh, Forever Chemicals comes from. Let me go very quickly over sort of a history, partial history of PFAS. Um, Polytetrafluoroethylene, which is Teflon, was first synthesized in 1938. It was discovered by DuPont here in New Jersey. Um, it became sort of commercialized in 49. In, in 1956, uh, 3M developed um, what's today Scotchgard, uh, which is a chemically a perfluorooctanosulfonic acid, PFOS. Um, in 68, the Navy developed these um, AFFF aqueous film forming foams uh, to fight fires. Um, it was first detected in blood of manufacturing workers in 1978. Um, 2002, 2006, they are being phased, they were phased out by 3M and uh, DuPont. Uh, unfortunately, as the production in the U.S. decreased, it has moved overseas. The total production worldwide has not decreased, but it's not, they're no longer being produced in the U.S. Most of it is now produced in China. In um, 2015, EPA started to do serious sampling in drinking water wells for the PFAS. 2016, EPA established an advisory drinking water is standard, which is not mandatory, but it's a suggested standard of 70 parts per trillion. Um, part per trillion, some people did the calculations, I'm not, I just repeat them. 
they say that in an Olympic size swimming pool, you probably have, a, if you fill it with sand, you have a trillion sand grains. One part per trillion would be one sand grain in an in a Olympic size swimming pool. So it's very, very little. Um, and just now the first country um, is Denmark that bans P PFAS in any kind of food packaging. Uh, other, other countries are still using it in food packaging. All right. The two big ones are this PFOA and PFOS. If we look at this molecule here on the left side for PFOA, we see that it is very symmetric. And on the right side, it is asymmetric. This symmetric part of the molecule is not soluble in water, while this asymmetric part is highly soluble in water. So we have this weird compound that is amphoteric, we call it. It's Part of the molecule is soluble in water, part not. That is typical for any kind of surfactant or soaps. We call it surfactant because this, this non-soluble part tries to get out of the water phase into the air phase. It lowers the surface tension in the process and that makes bubbles. Um, that's why soap makes bubbles. Um, and that's why these, these compounds um, are good for firefighting foam. They make, they make a lot of bubbles that, that asphyxiate the fire. Um, as I mentioned, uh, PFOS and PFOA have been found in blood samples of the general human population as well as in wildlife. They are toxic to laboratory animals and they have been associated with many, many health issues, including high cholesterol, increased liver enzymes, a decrease in vaccination response, especially for children, thyroid disorders, and, and cancer, mostly testicular and kidney cancer. Um, EPA has had their eyes on them. In 2002, they set a limit of 150 micrograms per limit. Those I suggested, they're not mandatory. Over the years, it has dropped down by um, over a factor of more than 1,000. Um, um, right now, it is 0 0.07 micrograms per liter, and this is combined. Um, for PFOA and PFOS. Uh, in terms of part per billion, this is 70 parts per billion. Some states, New Jersey included, have even lower standards than EPA. Um, some scientists, uh, for example, at the um, Environmental Working Group, they suggest to go as low as one uh, part per trillion. Um, when you compare that to trichloroethylene, um, which is a compound that we have heard a lot, is one of the main contaminants in Superfund sites. We're talking about 5,000 parts per trillion. So, so we're talking about a lot lower standards than, than for typical conventional priority pollutants. Um, for those of you that watch movies, um, trichloroethylene has been featured in this movie, A, a Civil Action and Aaron Brockovich. Um, PFOA is, is the main protagonist in, in, in dark waters, if you have seen it. To put it in perspective, uh, EPA estimates that PFOA in drinking water at 0 0.5 micrograms per liter would correspond to an extra cancer case in 1 million people. So this is the, the concentration that, that EPA suggested in 2006. So we, these numbers are supposed to be quite protective for the general population. All right, this map is, is from the Environmental Working Group. Uh, it's a compilation of PFAS in, in different uh, water sources. And since many of us are from New Jersey, it's a little distressing that you don't see New Jersey uh, giving all the dots. Um, you have to put it a little bit in context. When, when I looked at that map from 2019, uh, North Carolina was no different than Virginia and South Carolina in the next year it all of a sudden populated. That means that in that state, um, um, the Environment Protection Agency uh, went out and did a lot of sampling. Okay, Now, given that many of us in New Jersey, I sort of blow that, blow, I'm blowing this up. Princeton itself, they have not detected PFAS. Uh, in some local uh, smaller supply wells, they have found PFAS they are typically a factor of 10 lower than, than the EPA or in New Jersey drinking water standard. If that scares you and you want to run away and, and get bottled water, um, the consumer report just came out that um, out of 47 
bottled waters that are tested, 43 had a PFAS uh, in excess of one part per trillion. They say it was higher in carbonated water than non-carbonated water. We can discuss later why, why that may be and, and what the meaning may be. All right. Um, firefighting foam. There are many formulations for firefighting foam. These are these huge molecules. But like I pointed out first here, we have a very symmetric part of the molecule that is not soluble in water. Here we have an asymmetric one that is soluble in water. But what is important, once you apply firefighting foam and it gets into the soil, these bonds here that don't have fluorine, they can be easily broken off by, uh, by bacteria. And at the end, we end up again in, in these sort of compounds that are completely fluorinated. There are these um, perfluorinated alkyl acids that are stable. Okay. So we call a molecule like this a precursor for these perfluoroalkyl acids that, that, that build up. Um, so PFAS, Concentrations are therefore especially high in groundwater near airports, military or industrial facilities, especially with firefighters are, are being training, are trained using a, a triple F. At many airports, they just have to have, you've often seen an old airplane sitting there. A couple of times a year, they, they come up with their firefighting foam and, 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 and train how to turn the fires off. All right. Having said that, let's move on now to this next step. What is FIAMOX and who does it? Okay. Before I do that, let me, let me just go over some very basic concepts and sort of energetics of, of, of life. Um, all organisms need an energy source. Uh, for many of us, the energy source could be organic carbon, not, or, only, not only organisms, the, your, your, the, the engine in your car as an organic carbon as energy. And then we need um, oxidants, right? Um, we use oxygen as our oxidant to burn our sugars to get energy. In nature, especially bacteria can use different kinds of um, oxidants um, to oxidize uh, their energy source. And um, you go from oxygen, nitrate, manganese, iron. And what is important, as you move down this ladder, you get less and less energy um, when you oxidize the same exact sugar or, or oxidant. The, the bacteria that I'm going to talk about use iron as their oxidant, and they're called iron-reducing bacteria. They use ferric iron, which is iron-3, and convert that to ferrous iron, which is iron-2. So that is the oxidant. Um, when the next, I want to look at what carbon sources we may be interested in. So there are two kinds, depending on the carbon source organisms that, that uh, are either called heterotrophs. We are heterotrophs and um, we use organic carbon uh, for our energy. And we use some of that organic carbon then as our carbon source to synthesize uh, new cells. There are other organisms that are, are called chemoautotrophs and they obtain the energy from inorganic compounds, like uh, oxidizing ammonium to nitrate. That frees a lot of energy. They can use that energy then to fix inorganic carbon, CO2, and make organic carbon for their cell growth and keep some of that energy for, for their activities. Okay. If I'll be talking about an, um, an chemoautotroph that uses ammonium, oxidized ammonium to nitrite in, in in, in that process. All right, Mike mentioned some of our field work. This here is the Asum Pink Wildlife Management Area in 20 minutes or 15 minutes out of Heightstown. It's very pretty to go hiking. Um, it's, it's a state um, a preserve. Um, in the early 2000s, we did a lot of field work there, um, mostly looking at the effect of nitrogen runoff into riparian wetlands. If we go into the more forested area, we see here on, on the top, you see a little fallen tree, it tipped over and, and around the roots, you see that the soil is very red. That, that means it's a very iron rich soil. As we go to the pine barrens, this is in the direction of the pine barrens, uh, iron content in soil is very high. Here uh, on the left side, you see where water brought up dissolved iron, the ferrous iron, the iron two, 
to the surface, as soon as it gets in contact with oxygen, it gets oxidized to ferric iron, iron three, and forms these sort of orange crusts. Long story, but doing field work there, we, we, up, we observed that ammonium, this is NH4, was disappearing and nitrite was appearing. And in the process, we were consuming iron. So this was something that had not been reported before. Uh, we did first the energetics. We've shown that um, an organism could get energy out of this reaction. So we postulated, postulated that we have an anaerobic iron reducer that's a chemoautotroph. We published that in, in the early in 2005, another paper in 2009. In 2006, this Japanese fellow, Sawayama, uh, found something similar in a chemical, in a biochemical reactor, and he called this term Fiamox. And that, that term has stuck with it. In uh, 2012, a group at Berkeley um, discovered something similar or noticed a similar process in rainforest soils in Puerto Rico. And ever since, many people have, have um, noticed this Fiamox process. We spent a lot of time doing incubations, several papers uh, between then and the next one, but eventually we managed to isolate this bacterium that is responsible for this Fiamox process, the oxidation of ammonium to nitrite. Uh, we called it an acetylmicrobium, a strain A6, and it is a chemoautotrophic iron reducer. Um, we have shown that it can use ammonium or hydrogen as the energy source and uses ferric iron as the oxidant or, or the electron acceptor. Okay, this was published in 2018 in, in this journal plus. Now having that organism, well one more thing to say, when you have an autotrophic organism they always grow much slower than heterotrophic because much of the energy they obtain from their energy source they have to use to make organic carbon. In addition to that, when you go from oxygen as your oxidant all the way down to iron, you get much less energy. So when, when we look at the doubling time of E. coli, which is an organism that most of us have heard of at least, doubling time is the time that needs to double the cell numbers, it's about 20 minutes. This acyl microbium, the doubling time is sort of between 10 and 14 days. A very, very slow growing organism, which, which provides challenges for us in, 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 in using it for multi, multiple applications. All right, having that organism, uh, we could um, uh, do a um, um, genome sequencing. And what we noticed is that it has genes for reductive dehalogenase. Okay? What, what does that mean? Um, a reductive dehalogenase is an enzyme that allows the organism to transfer the electron to a halogen compound uh, that could be associated with an organic um, compound like uh, organic chlorine or organic bromine. Etc. So that that was intriguing. Why it would have this reductive dehalogenases? So that we decide, are we able to defluorinate PFAS? So the general thought is that PFAS are hard to defluorinate. Most studies have been done with under aerobic conditions. So we had this anaerobic iron reducing organism that we were going to check out. Here are the typical incubations. So here you see an incubation at the beginning. Our iron is still oxidized after a few weeks. Our iron is reduced, it becomes black, and we usually have a big, big batch of, of, of vials that we set up and sample them uh, over time. So we took a whole bunch of different PFAS, uh, just, just to get a sense, different names, um, different, different sizes of molecules, uh, different functional groups. The red ones are perfluorinated ones, the black one are polyfluorinated ones. Um, Dr. Huang, who's working with me, did those incubations and, and she, we observed that over 60 days we started to degrade a reasonable amount of these, um, these uh, PFAS. Um, we started with 100 milligrams per liter and they decreased by this amount. And more interesting, we started to see the production of fluoride. If something disappears, you're not quite sure what is happening. Is it, uh, did it volatilize? Did it absorb? 
But once we start seeing the production of fluoride, that means that we have broken them apart and the organic fluorine is now freed and, and, and freed as fluoride. So given these results, we went back and we said, look, the two big ones are PFOA, PFOS. These are the perfluorinated ones. We didn't dare to hope that we could defluorinate them, but these results showed that we could. And um, we did a very rigorous study. This, was, this came out a little bit over, over a year ago in this environmental science and technology paper. I'm just going to show one slide from this, this paper. Um, here I'm showing for incubations, 60 days, a PFOA. Uh, the blue ones are controls. We had all kinds of uh, different controls. The red one is the concentration of PFOA when I have a pure culture of A6. And the black one is when I have an enrichment culture where we, where we have the other kinds of organisms present um, and not just the pure culture. The pure culture tells us that this is the organism that can do the, fluorine, the defluorination. But in reality, for applications, it would be very hard to work with a pure culture and we will be working more with an enrichment culture. What we see here on the right is that we are producing fluoride, um, showing that we can completely break down the PFOA. And here at the bottom, we see that we are building up, at, at the beginning, we did not have any of these uh, smaller PFAS. So we see that we produce perfluoroheptanoic acid, perfluorohexanoic acid, pentanoic and butanoic acid, seven carbons, six carbons, five carbons, and four carbons. They are being produced as we start to degrade the perfluorooctanoic acid, which has eight carbons. Looking at the amount of fluorine that produced the amount of intermediates, we did some very rigorous mass balance showing that we are actually not losing any, any of our PFOA to, to, to sorption or volatilization, that we are actually breaking it down. Um, so let's talk about these reductive dehalogenases, which is quite interesting and novel. So we we so that we, I mentioned that we have genes for these reductive dehalogenases. We can, in, in using molecular tools, you can see if a gene is expressed. That means a gene is expressed when it is working to make the enzyme that, that it has the blueprint in, to, to design. Um, so when, when we do incubations with these organisms and we have no PFAS, the, no dehalogenase is expressed. When we do incubations in the presence of PFAS, we see that two of the dehalogenases are expressed. RDHA, which is a reductive dehalogenase, and FCEA, which is rel rel related to fluoroacetate dehalogenase, which, which is one of the dehalogenases, as you can guess from the name, has been associated with de defluorinating fluoroacetate. Um, RDHA, the RDHA gene is a completely novel gene and neither we nor collaborators that we're working now at the University of Minnesota and Larry Wackett's group have done um, genomic database searches and, and there's no gene that, that is known that is in close to this, this gene, which explains possibly why people have not seen reductive defluorination of something like PFAS before and why these um, this organism may be so different. Okay, here I'm showing um, for multiple um, incubations that we've done uh, the amount of fluoride produced versus the amount of this RDHA being expressed and the fluoroacetate gene expressed. We see that we have a much better correlation uh, for our reductive dehalogenase gene than for the fluoroacetate dehalogenase gene. And what we see what um, Dr. Huang has recently done, she has knocked out both the RDHA and the FCEA gene. If we knock the FCEA gene out, we, steep, we keep defluorinating PFAS. If we knock the RDHA gene out, we stop defluorinating PFAS. Neither gene is needed to oxidize ammonium because the organism is perfectly fine to keep oxidizing ammonium in the process. All right, so now having said that we we are looking at these genes in more detail. I'm not an enzymologist, but I'm working with, with enzymologists in the chemistry department and at the University of Minnesota to try to understand what these enzymes are and can we synthesize these enzymes. 
um, and I have a collaboration with the, the um, Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and they're doing a large search to see if there's any organism that may have a similar gene that may be able to use to degrade PFAS. All right. So one application, and, and once we made our, our findings public, I was approached by lots of folks from industrial as well as domestic wastewater treatment plants. And, and the reason is PFAS accumulate in biosolids. I'll explain in a sec what biosolids are, but biosolids are rich in nutrients and at the end of a wastewater treatment process, they're usually applied to agricultural lands. But if biosolids are contaminated with PFAS and if regulations may come up that you cannot apply PFAS contaminated by solids to land, then they are stuck. They, they have to come up with, with with expensive alternatives, all of a sudden the biosolids they produce become a hazardous waste. So very quickly, this is the Princeton treatment plant. This is here, this, this water that's churning, that's very brown, and sewage by itself is transparent. That's all biosolids. That's all bacteria that, that are degrading uh, the wastewater that goes into the treatment plant. Out of this tank, it goes into clarifier where you separate the water from the biosolids before you move the water on out to the river. Uh, here is the sedimentation tank empty. It's a big device. The solids drop to the bottom and then they're sent back to the tank. From here, they go into large filter presses. This, this is a picture of a filter press at DC water. And at the end, you end up with your biosolids that you can, can apply to land, okay? Um, so we obtained sludges from a wastewater treatment plant from a major US um, chemical manufacturer, and we incubated the sludges and filter cake solids. So the sludge, the sludge is from here, and the filter cake is what comes out directly as, out of this filter. And we up incubated them under various conditions um, without adding anything as a control, adding iron, adding our bacterium, acetobacterium strain A6, and adding both the bacterium and iron. And what we observed after a few weeks of incubation is that only when we added iron and the acetobacterium strain A6 did we produce uh, fluoride. Um, and we started to degrade um, um, PFAS that, that are in these biosolids. So we did a more rigorous study. We took a um, filter cake sample and we, we added some PFOA ourselves, 10 milligrams per liter. Uh, we could see gray is control, black is, is the active sample. We see that the PFOA decreases with time and with time we see fluoride being produced. Uh, the same thing for our activated sludge sample. This is, this is the solids that come right out of our activated sludge tank. We see degradation, we see fluoride production. Interesting, we added exactly the same amount of PFOA to both. We added exactly the same, same amount of bacteria and iron, but the rate of degradation was not the same. Um, something that we're trying to understand is in that filter cake, it could be a micronutrient, could be some bacteria that a co-culture that, that our acetobacterium likes that, that makes it work better. In fact, when I look at here, we have eight milligrams per liter of PFOA that disappeared. If I convert that to molar and multiply, divided by molecular weight and times 15, if fluorines, I come up with exactly 0.3 millimoles of fluorine. So I, I completely degraded, or, or acetobacterium completely degraded um, all the PFOA in these samples. Not here. Uh, here we have to have um, intermediates that we have not analyzed yet. All right. Um, I'm getting close to my, uh, I'm on time. Um, one of the challenges we have is, is this reaction, right? So we need six irons per ammonium. So that's a lot of iron, theoretically 75 grams per gram of ammonium, in reality, probably twice as much, okay? Um, so that, that makes this Fiamox reaction 
difficult uh, for practical applications. It's hard to run a bioreactor where we add these large amounts of iron. I, I don't quite know how to get the iron out or how to separate the iron then from the bacterium. So the question is, are there alternatives to using iron as the oxidant or electron acceptor? And last year, is some students of mine and, and, and did some experiments and we found and reported in this paper that like many other iron reducing bacterium, Acetobacterium A6 is electrogenic, uh, meaning that it can transfer the electron to an anode uh, as opposed to, to iron two. So we went out and checked that. So here's a very simple sketch of a bioelectrochemical reactor. We have an, it's, it's, it's like a battery, right? So we have an anode, we have a cathode, the organism oxidizes ammonium to nitrite. It produces, it frees six electrons. The electrons go to the anode. You put a little external power uh, uh, in so that the electrode is driven from the anode to the cathode. And the cathode, it will react with protons to form hydrogen gas, okay? We then decided, so we, we've, we've shown that we um, can Oxidize ammonium in these, um, they're called microbial electrolysis cells. We, we could uh, grow Acetobacterium A6, um, produce some current, and then we decided to check can we degrade PFAS in these reactors? And yes, we could. Over 18 days, uh, we did run these reactors with a pure culture or with an enrichment culture. We degraded 62% of PFOA in a pure culture MEC and 82% in the enrichment culture MEC. So what are we doing now? Um, we're trying to go from this little batch reactors, which are not very practical, they're just proof of concept, to a continuous flow reactor. So here we have um, the same concept. Here is, is our anodic chamber. Our anode now is, is granulated, is in a granulated form. Uh, the flow comes in here. Our we connect the anode to the cathode with the external power source. And um, we are trying to sort of, this is, this here's our power source. We are trying to see if we can emulate what we've seen in this microbial electrolysis cells in a continuous flow reactor and scale this process up. That would allow us now to have a biological reactor in which we can destroy the PFAS or a biological reactor in which we can grow our Acetobacterium A6 and then augment uh, biosolids with it or contaminated sediments for the purpose of cleanup. And I will end here some sort of key comments and conclusions. So this novel Acetobacteria CIA A6 uh, can defluorinate PFAS, um, um, especially PFOA and POFOA, PFOS using both ammonium or hydrogen as electron donor. I did not talk about hydrogen. Hydrogen almost looks the results we have that it could be more efficient than ammonium. Um, we have a novel um, reductive dehalogenase that is linked to this defluorination and that may explain why this has not been seen in, in, in other organisms so far. Um, there are exciting results, but still a lot of work to be able to scale that to industrial applications. Mostly we need we need to be able to produce a large amount of biomass of this extremely slow growing Acetobacteria cii A6. And lastly, it's worth to mention that these are extremely novel findings and they go against conventional wisdom. So there are people that are slightly skeptic and we are working with other people, giving them our strain so that they can verify what we have found. And of course, once we have with our collaborators in chemistry and, and, and at the University of Minnesota um, determined how that enzyme works, then, then it will be quite clear what, what is happening and, and probably everybody's possible doubt may be, may be erased. Anyway, I want to acknowledge my team. Um, most of the experiments were done by Dr. Huang, who has been working with me since 2013. Um, some of the results that I've shown are from Boitao Shuai or Melanie Ruiz. Um, what I want to point out is these two, Project X and the Helen Shipley Fund, those are generous 
Princeton alumni or spouses of alumni that have made um, funding available. It's very hard to go out and come up with off, offhand ideas and go to NSF and get funding. Uh, so we were able to sort of get this going with internal funding and now we do have funding from the Department of um, Defense. Um, big companies like ExxonMobil and hopefully more are about to uh, come up. And with this, I'll stop sharing and I'm pass it on to Bess Wart to start the discussion. Excellent. Uh, I'll jump in just for a minute, Peter. So uh, thanks for a, for a terrific talk. Um, my job right now is only to, uh, to introduce Bess. Uh, I think almost all of you know Bess, either from the talk she gave or from other things she's done. Uh, in the PEI uh, series, but uh, Bess is the William J. Sinclair Professor of Geosciences and PEI. And uh, as most of you know, she's also uh, the department chair in the Department of Geosciences. Much of her work is uh, sort of geomicrobiology, but focused on oceans, while Peter's doing his work in soils. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to these two having a conversation with, you, with each other. So I'm going to bow out and let them take over. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Bess. Thank you, Mike. That was really cool, Peter, really exciting. Um, and you mentioned that it was somewhat controversial. By that, against the prevailing wisdom, do you mean that nobody, that, that people are doubtful that can, it can happen because it's not supposed to happen anaerobically or, or bugs just aren't supposed to be able to defluorinate? It, the, the people have tried for years to look at the defluorination of these perfluorinated compounds and, and, and tried multiple uh, organisms and they haven't been able to do it. So the, the thought was that these compounds are so stable that you cannot defluorinate it, that you need a carbon hydrogen bond to allow organisms to, to defluorinate, that if you don't have it, it is too stable and that the energy that you need is just too high. So the, the conventional wisdom has been that perfluorinated compounds cannot be defluorinated. Much less under anaerobic conditions, I would think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And plus, I, if, it, it occurs to me that it might be even more difficult. They're using particulate iron. Yes. Yeah, that's a really hard thing they've chosen to do evolutionarily. Yes. And, <laughs> and, 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 and that's why it grows so slow. Yeah. So, so if I can digress a little bit, one thing we have shown in that uh, Applied Environmental Microbiology paper is that um, the organism has a hard time competing to grow on iron surfaces compared to heterotrophic iron reducers like Geobacter and Chironella. And so a hypothesis that we have that we still need to prove is that it developed these capabilities of um, transferring electrons to natural halogenated compounds to compete when, when it doesn't have access to iron. Wow. So that uh, brings up a, um, something that a couple of people in the audience have questioned, because they also recognize that this was a really hard thing for uh, your bug to do, and wondered, um, I'm just not going to, I'm going to try not to murder your names, so probably I'm not going to say your names, so forgive me for that. Um, but a couple of people have wondered why this organism isn't heterotrophic. Is there some reason that it, is there some way that it could be heterotrophic? including perhaps cloning its reductase genes into some other organism. What are, I guess those are other questions about how you might um, capitalize on or develop the, the further the capability that you've discovered. Yeah, I, I, I don't know why it is not heterotrophic. Um, we, we certainly tried all kinds of carbon sources um, that are very typical for, for um, heterotrophic organisms, a, a wide range. It would not grow in, on any carbon source. Um, but when we added um, C14 label CO2, we could see that it would assimilate the, the C14 carbon in its biomass. Um, when we grow it in any of those incubations, it doesn't grow unless we have CO2 in the headspace. Um, now, why? I, I don't know why heterotrophs, why autotrophs decided to exist. <laughs> it's, well, they, evolutionarily, it's evolution. probably because they can do something that nobody else can, right? 
Right, right. Yeah. So they can find niches where, where others yeah. cannot live. Yeah. And so in, in a, thinking about why they wouldn't do both, mixotrophy is a possibility for a lot of organisms. But on the other hand, the, the genetic machinery, the metabolic machinery required to be a heterotroph is really quite different from what you need to be an autotroph. And if your whole cell is tuned to making everything you need from one carbon compound, mm -hmm. then that's a lot of machinery that you can't just switch off and switch in and out the genes easily, right? So maybe mm -hmm. there are evolutionary constraints on that once you've gone that pathway. So yeah. think of going that pathway. Um, are there other organisms, do you think there'll be other organisms that can do this or is this organism found everywhere? Well, the, the or, organism, we, we have done a study in the second in the series of these papers where we looked at many locations. Well, we, we got in the car and sampled New Jersey widely, and we, we got samples from the Southeast uh, US, and then the collaboration with China, we got a lot of samples from China. We found that the organism is quite universally available as long as we have acidic soils and iron rich. Uh, typically in wetlands, in rice paddies, it's quite common. Um, we just finished a study in the Noose River sediments and, and it's the, the Noose, as we discussed earlier, has a lot of ammonium from the concentrated feedlots. Um, the Southeast is iron rich and the Noose is acidic. So the, the organism is quite is there at quite high numbers. And we took some of those sediments out, we added PFAS and we, we could see that we see production of fluoride. So that makes me think of your map. Um, and that makes you wonder if people have just haven't looked in some of those places where there were no dots. It's not just that North Carolina is contaminated, but they looked for it in North Carolina. So you That's would correct. predict that you'd find it elsewhere under those environmental conditions. That, that is correct. Yeah. Yeah. How about in the ocean? Had to ask. Um, we we do ha we did get some estuarine samples, um, even a mile into from the mouth of the estuary where we did see it. We have not gotten any samples from the ocean. I might be able to help you with that. All right. Yeah. We so there are, yes. there's some questions, um, some common themes in the questions about uh, your bug um, versus. Um, the enrichment, so the pure culture, and this is not unusual for a pure culture to not be as happy in pure culture as it is in an enrichment, but can you speculate right. on why that might be? In terms of its efficiency and growth rate and ability to break down the, the PFAS? Well, I, I, as you said, I mean, some organisms cannot even be grown as a pure culture, and the, let's say the, the sister organism, which the Anamox, bacterium, right? I think you work with it. Um, people are not growing it in a pure culture. Um, it often needs a co-culture. Um, what, what we have seen, we can isolate it, uh, but after a few generations, it disappears on us. So we, we constantly have to re-isolate re, re it. Uh, we don't know what is missing. Is it a co-culture? Is it some micronutrient that is missing? Um, I don't know. It is clearly not happy. In, by itself, and then those those um, examples which where we added it to the activated sludge sample and to the filter cake sample, it really did thrive in the filter cake sample and not this much in the activators. I don't know what the difference is. Um, the filter cake sample is much more oxidized. It may have more micronutrients. It may have it may have more recalcitrant organics and the organism it takes advantage of uh, electron shuttling components to transfer the electron to the iron source so so all, all of those help to to make it make it more active yeah hmm. so there are several questions in the q a about the conditions that enhance its activity or that you've tested um one of them wants to know is it or I'm going to phrase it as, is this organism an obligate anaerobe? Does oxygen have some effect on its uh, metabolism? Yes, it is. Uh, we, we don't need highly reducing conditions, but it is an anaerobe. When under oxygen conditions, it doesn't work. Uh, but um, like um, 
like Geobacter 2, you see that that does, that's a very common iron reducer. When you have wet soils, um, you do have micro locations in the soil that are anaerobic. And so you do, it, 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 it's not that the whole soil is deeply anaerobic. You, it's, it's active in, in damp soils. And we have not looked at bone dry soils, but as long as we have reasonably wet soils, we do see it. So it could persist under various conditions and then yeah. when we wetted, um, be right. more active, that kind right. of thing. Yeah. Right, right. It, 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 getting exposed to oxygen, it stops its activity, but that doesn't kill it. So the, it's, the unique thing is that this uh, organism can defluorinate. Does it dehalogenate other things like TCE or its relatives or brominated compounds? Uh, yes, we, I skipped over that. We looked at di, dibromoethylene uh, early on and we did see de, debromination. Um, we need to go back to that. I, um, that was the initial sort of what is what's going on here question. Um, but I don't know if it's the same reductive dehalogenase that is expressed with other kind of compounds because it has, it has a few reductive dehalogenases. It could be another dehalogenase. Um, we looked at trichloroethylene degradation. That's a paper that we published two years ago. So it does degrade trichloroethylene, but we did not see dichloroethylene building up. So, so I, the, the enzyme that it has to oxidize ammonium is very similar to um, methane monooxygenase. And methane monooxygenase epoxidized the double bond of trichloroethylene. And that goes to trichloroethylene epoxide, which is very unstable and, and very hard to detect. So we hypothesize that that is what is happening. One of the postdoctoral fellows in my lab um, is, is, is looking at that now again to see if we, what, what kind of enzyme we see being expressed, a uh, gene we see being expressed. Yeah. So thinking about that, the novel reductive halogenase, um, how, uh, this is a question from John Tracy, who's a student in my lab, which you might've been able to guess, um, okay. wants to know, how you knew it was a reductive dehalogenase if it's not like anything else in the world? Well, it has, let's say, an 80% an similarity to, to typical dehalogenase. So you can tell it was functional, but it's yes, really yes. A far out there. Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, let's see. We've got several questions and I'm sort of moving around between them. Um, one of the things that you mentioned, it's, it's cousin you called it, but of course it's not related, um, the Animox bacterium. Mm -hmm. Um, and the idea of, of developing uh, your organism, whose name I sh should be able to remember and pronounce, Acidomycobium. Yes. Um, whether it could be commercially developed, and because I'm sure it's doing its thing in nature, but slowly, and in order to uh, use it commercially, you might want to exploit it the way others have Animox. And one of the things I remember about when Animox was first discovered, it would take up to two years to enrich that thing in a wastewater treatment plant. Yes. Is that one of the challenges you foresee for your organism? Right, that is exactly, I mean, the, it's growing so slow, right? And then um, if we have, we, we, we built a membrane reactor that we operated for almost a year, but we, you have to add ferrihydrite and the ferrihydrite is slowly converted to magnetite. It's still a solid. It's very hard then to separate the magnetite from the bacteria. So, so that's why we are looking now at these um, bioelectrochemical reactors where we can grow it in the absence of, of ferric iron. And, and there the hope is, can we grow it to large enough mass that we can then sort of take a cubic meter of a high dense cell solution and use it um, to, to bio augment uh, biosolids or contaminated soils, etc. Yeah. yeah. But that's, that's, that's our bottleneck and major challenge right now that, that hopefully over the next few years we'll, we'll solve. Right. Or at least be able to figure out how to handle the scale that's required. Yes. yes, yeah. yes. So several people um, have questions actually about the pH. 
um, which is a master variable in biology, but it sounds like your organism can survive in a range of pHs, right? Um, is that going to be a factor in comparing what it can do in, in the reactor versus in nature versus in the bioreactor? Well, only acidic. It doesn't, it doesn't, when you looked at that FIAMOX reaction, you, if you remember, it had 10 protons on the left side, so it's very pH sensitive. Um, and, and you don't get energy of that reaction once P, the pH becomes neutral. And we have never seen the organism in, in alkaline conditions. So it's surprising. It works at a pH of two, which is <laughs> pretty, pretty um, acidic. Um, yeah. the, the optimal, we typically have around four. Um, uh, but it, we see activity until about, um, to about 6.5. Okay, so, so it's not, it's sensitive, but it, it's not lethal. Yeah, yeah, over yeah, yeah. Can it use metals other than iron? Yes, we, but, so we have been able to reduce uranium-6 to uranium-4. Um, we have been able to reduce copper-2 to copper-1. Um, now, it's not terribly useful. Um, Copper one is unstable, goes right away to copper, copper two back. A uh, uranium, um, um, it would work as a secondary electron acceptor. In all cases, we need, um, we use in in a couple of days, let's say half a millimole of ammonium. So if we need six times as much iron, that means we need three millimoles of iron. That's a lot. Yeah. So if I substituted for an other metal. And most of them at that concentrations would be toxic. So, so, so it, it can reduce all metals, but as a secondary electron acceptor. Right. So just a hard thing to do. You know, we didn't get any questions about people worried about their water quality, but we did have some updates. Um, Lorraine Hackett tells us, that, tells us that, in fact, there are 8,163 registered PFAS type chemicals. So it's even worse. Oh, wow. than okay. And Gloria Post from the New Jersey Department of environmental protection tells us that the actual New Jersey drinking water guidance value has been decreased below the 40 that you said to like oh. 20 or 30. Okay. And that awesome. makes me, brings up a question that I think we would have been asked. Um, is it worse to eat a fried egg out of a Teflon frying pan or to drink your drinking water? I mean, we've been exposed to both of those sources of, of PFAs for 70 years. Well, some of us aren't 70 years old, but in general, the yes, public yes. has. Um, you know, what's, what's, is it a worry? Look, I, I, I'm not working in that area. But from what I understand, your Teflon pan should be safe unless you scratch it physically. Or, Which we or, never you, do. or you heat it way too high. Uh, but if you use it according to the manufacturer's recommendation, it's supposed to be fine. Uh, also remember that that the Teflon is a huge polymer that that is not going to come off easily. Um, when you when you buy it, it quote Teflon or treat pan, it 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 says today when you not no made without PFOA. Um, so DuPont switched a couple of years from PFOA, they, they phased it out to what they call Gen X. Gen X is a much smaller molecule, um, also fluorinated compound um, to make Teflon. Um, the thought was that a smaller molecule does not bioaccumulate as much as the large molecules. Um, that's correct. Um, do we know that it is truly, truly non-toxic? I don't think any large-scale toxicological studies yeah. have been done. So, Peter, I think we have to go soon. I wanted to ask one last question, which was, um, what's the most exciting thing you're going to do next with this research? Or what are you most excited to do? I, I want to see this process scaled up so that we can applied to um, the great PFAS at a commercial scale, um, either in a wastewater treatment plant or in a contaminated groundwater. In right now, at um, PFAS contaminated groundwater sites, 
are usually done via physical or chemical means. In some places, they heat a whole block of soil to almost 1,000 degrees to mm -hmm. volatilize the PFAS and then flush them out. That's very energy intensive. And there are also chemical means to do that. If we can do that biologically, that would be really exciting. Um, less intensive, probably less, less more, more environmentally benign. So well, thank you I, I'll hope in, in the next few years that we may go to a site or some location where we can actually test out at, yeah. at a larger scale that, that things that we can do in our 50 milliliter flasks and work in the field. Good luck and thank you. Excellent. Thank, thank you. you both, uh, Bess and Peter, for a terrific discussion. Uh, questions keep coming in. The participants are still uh, uh, hanging around, although uh, the numbers are going down, of course, uh, as time goes by. We're, you know, we are sensitive to the length of time of Zoom calls that, that we all spend these days. Um, if you had, Peter, I, I, I'm going to take the liberty of saying that for those who had questions that were not answered, uh, you can uh, send an email directly to Peter. And uh, Peter, if that's okay, then, uh, then, then you can just go ahead and provide some brief answers that way. Um, and with that said, I'll remind all of you that our, our next uh, talk will be um, November 3rd by our colleague Anne McClintock. Um, and I hope that we'll see all of you back here. And another very big thank you to, uh, to uh, Bess and especially to Peter for a terrific talk today. So thank you all very much for joining and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.